and hear me when I tell you this. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. There is a blessing in everything. Behind every moment of adversity in your life, there is a blessing and a lesson. Every moment of adversity has those two things. Pain always leaves a gift. Sometimes the breakup is the blessing. See, sometimes you gotta get rid of a man in order for God to give you the man that you really need. You just have to hang in there. He might have something better for you. Don't worry about the people that God has removed from your life. He saw things you didn't see. He heard conversations you couldn't hear. And he saw he made moves you wouldn't make. Everything you're going through is preparing you for what you ask God for. You just gotta quit tripping while you're in the process because the process is necessary. You may not see it now, but when he gets you on the other side of it, you're gonna see exactly why it went that way. And you're gonna be okay with it. But quit tripping during the process. Oh Lord, why me? You ain't the only one. Oh Lord, why me? You ain't the only one. Oh Lord, why I lose my job? You ain't the only one unemployed. Oh Lord, why he leave me? You ain't the first chick got left. Lord, if I could just stay with him a little bit longer. Maybe you don't need him. Maybe he the reason you ain't got nothing now. Well, I don't want to leave him because I've been with him eight years. Well, hold up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You want eight more years of this? Let his monkey go. But now, God can't give you what you want because you want to hold on to what you got. You all in the way. Now you telling him how to bless you. You can't tell God how to bless you. It's a simple process. The only reason I'm telling you this, because this is how I made it. I just do me. I just, I'm just being me. I stay uniquely who I am, because you are okay just the way you are, because you, God made you uniquely who you are. He wanted you to be just like you are. What do you do when what God gave you to ride in starts coming apart? Do you give up hope? Do you walk away? I don't want you to define success or to ask God to preserve the temporary. See, God promised to get you there, but he didn't say how. And if you're not careful, you will put all your energy and you'll put all of your work into preserving something that God only gave you for a season. God brings some people in your life to get you from point A to point B. The thing you was counting on to get you to the other side. The job you thought you'd retire with. The house you thought you'd have the rest of your life. And the storm got it. How many of you have lost some stuff in the storm? lost some people in the storm and it made you feel like a failure it was a temporary blessing if it was meant to stay it couldn't leave you're in love with what you had and you think that if your life does not retain the shape that you started with you don't think that it can get you where you're going i have learned that every blessing doesn't come to stay. Every friend is not gonna be a lifelong friend. And if they walk away, don't stand there and cry over what was, because if you'd have needed them for the future, they would have stayed. God uses people to help move us toward our destiny. But here's the key. You can't become so dependent on people that you're getting your worth and value out of how they treat you. It's easy to become addicted to compliments, addicted to encouragement, addicted to them cheering you on. Now you rely on them to keep you feeling good about yourself, to always be there to validate you, to make you feel approved. Like a drug, if they don't keep you fixed, meet all your expectations, you get discouraged, feel inferior, work overtime to try to win their approval. 
If you rely on people, you'll be disappointed. People will let you down. People will get busy and not be there when you need it. Sometimes people will even turn on you. Quit relying on people. What they do or don't do doesn't determine your worth. What they give you or don't give you cannot stop your purpose. Quit waiting for people to approve you and start approving yourself. People may not encourage you, you can encourage yourself. People may not make you feel special, you can make yourself feel special. I know I'm crowned with favor. I'm one of a kind, I'm a masterpiece. You'll have better relationships if you'll start validating yourself. If you're always depending on somebody else, you'll become needy, a burden, waiting for other people to keep you fixed. Can I tell you, your friends, family members, they have enough problems of their own. They have enough issues that they're dealing with to not come home and have to work on you for three hours. That's not only hurting you, it's unfair to the people God put in your life. They're not responsible for your happiness. They're not responsible to keep you cheered up. Don't put that extra pressure on them. If you're basing that off of what people give you, then if they change their mind, if they stop doing it, you'll feel devalued. Well, Joel, my parents didn't raise me right. I didn't have a good childhood. My spouse never compliments me. My boss didn't give me the credit that I deserve. I say this respectfully. If you didn't get it, you didn't need it. They can't stop your destiny. What they say or do cannot override God's plan for your life. That person that walked away, did you wrong, made hurtful comments, shake off the disrespect. Don't believe the lies that you're not talented enough, attractive enough, good enough. They don't determine your value. They can't lessen your self-worth. The only power people have over you is the power that you give them. It's good when people encourage us, when they cheer us on. What I'm saying is don't become dependent on that. If you'll start passing these tests, not relying on people, you'll not only live more confident, more secure, but I believe and declare you're going to overcome obstacles that looked insurmountable, accomplish dreams that seemed impossible, and reach the fullness of your destiny. God put people in your life for a reason. Others are there for a season. And it's very important that you recognize when people's seasons are over. God put people in your life for a reason. Other people are there for a season. Is the season over? Or have you decided because you're desperate because you just need validation. You need all of these people and things around you. You've decided to drag these random people into the new season of your life. You have a boat. And your boat is at its capacity. And in order for your boat to not sink and go underwater, and that could be your career, that could be your life, that could be your, your personal life, your relationships, is that relationship over? Do you feel mentally, spiritually, and emotionally stimulated in that relationship? Are you just holding on to it because you got this concept of loyalty that you have overused, overused, and overabused? Well, I've learned that loyalty has an expiration date. Loyalty isn't some open-ended thing that just goes on forever because technically some people just don't really make sense for your life and the new season, the mind and the space that you're in. Think about this. This is, this, is the, this is a reminder that loyalty has an expiration date. You ever been in a relationship with some folks three years ago and then you run into them and you're like, man, what does I think of dating her or dating him? And you almost want to beat yourself up for even the fact that you were in love or had all of these ridiculous feelings for this person. That shows you right there that, that loyalty has an expiration date. You could never see yourself not being with that person. But at a certain point, all of the signs and wonders revealed itself that that relationship is over. So if you had drugged that person, those people, those friends, 
into the new season of your life, your life wouldn't be going as well as it's going right now. I can't tell you, if you don't get anything else, you have to look at your relationships and you've got to ask yourself the question, what is this relationship doing to me? And I mean in every area of your life. When the doctor looked at me and said, you have cancer. Cancer is the most feared word in seven different languages. One of the first things I had to do, I found out who had cancer at some point in time or was living with cancer and conquered it. I surrounded myself with people who had done what I wanted to do, who were winning at the game. See, it's, it's very important every area of your life. If you want to improve your health, start hanging around healthy people. They did a 30-year a, a study and said that the reason that most people are obese, it's a mind virus. Listen to what they said. A mind virus is communicated mind to mind. That if you have a friend that's fat or you marry somebody that's obese, you have a 41% to up to 161% of becoming obese yourself. Even if they live in another state. Whoa, why? Because birds of a feather flock together. Never forget high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington said, Mr. Brown, if you run around with nine broke people, I guarantee you, you'll become number 10. Whoa, think about that. Part of your mindset development, not only listening, not only reading, but you have got to look at your relationships, upgrade your relationships, and continue to evaluate them and make sure they're an asset to you and not a liability. My son, John Leslie, is a motivational speaker. He has a saying, who should you count on and who should you count out? See, there's some relationships that can start out real positive, and then sometimes we outgrow people. Have you ever outgrown someone, somebody you used to be close to, used to be your bosom buddy, and then you haven't been together for a time, and then when you get together, you have absolutely nothing in common. Sometimes that happened with family members. My twin brother, it's a strained conversation because he's talking about less. Did you hear who died? No, I don't get up reading the obituary column. I'm glad my name is not there. Hello? I don't care. I'm focusing on living. Our conversations are so different. We all have things happen to us in life that we don't understand. Doors that have closed or people that have turned on us. It's easy to live frustrated fight against everything we don't like. We think that it's holding us back. Everything serves his plan. Not just the good things. The person that walked away is serving his plan. If that wouldn't have happened, you couldn't reach your destiny. What you couldn't see was God had something better. You may not like it. It doesn't seem fair, but it's serving his plan. When you understand that everything serves his plan, then you won't live frustrated. You won't get upset because you didn't get your way. The person that walked away wasn't a coincidence. It was God moving them away. We need to see difficulties in a new light. How do you know that closed door, that disappointment is not setting you up for something that you've never seen? The scripture says, our steps are being ordered by the Lord. If you weren't supposed to be there, you wouldn't be there. Don't be upset over that person that's trying to make you look bad. You need them to reach your destiny. It wasn't a coincidence. It's positioning you for something bigger. Sometimes it's going to feel like you're going backwards. You have to trust him when you don't understand. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. Now the test, while it's not good, will you stay in faith? When it's unfair, will you believe that God is still on the throne? That what he started in your life, he's going to finish? God will use people being against you to move you into your purpose. You need people that try to throw you into the pit so you can take your throne. People can't override what God has ordained for you. I wonder if you're upset over something that's serving his plan. A person that walked away, it doesn't make sense. Stay in peace, it's all a part of the plan. 
God knows what you're going to need in the future. Many of the challenges that you're facing now, they don't have anything to do with now. It's positioning you for something in your future. You will see how God will begin to connect the dots. Instead of being bitter, have a new perspective. It's serving His plan. The betrayal, the closed doors can be discouraging. It's not working against you, it's working for you. God will never close a door without opening a bigger and a better door. If you'll keep the right attitude, one day you'll look back, Lord, thank you for closing that door. Thank you for moving that person out of my life. I would have never met my amazing spouse. We don't grow in the good times. Everyone is for us. Things are falling into place. We grow when it's difficult, when we have to stretch. That's why you can't pray away every challenge. If the situation is not changing, then God is using the situation to change you. If God made everything easy for us, we wouldn't be ready for where we're going. God has amazing things in your future. But to get there, you're going to have to defeat some big giants, outlast some strong opposition. You have to stand strong and show the opposition that you're more determined than they are. That challenge is not going to defeat you, it's going to promote you. Instead of complaining about what's not turning around, See that as an opportunity to develop your faith. Keep doing the right thing when the wrong thing is happening. Keep thanking God when you don't see any sign of it. His grace doesn't mean He's going to remove every challenge. It means He's going to increase your strength so it doesn't feel as difficult. Now you can handle what you couldn't handle in the past. What used to bother you doesn't bother you anymore. Isn't it interesting how you could be raised in the same family, same circumstances, by the same parents and end up dramatically different? It's called life. Never underestimate the power of influence. What an important statement. The influence of those around us is so powerful. Many times we don't even realize we're being strongly influenced because it generally develops over an extended period of time. If you're around people who spend all they make, chances are excellent that you'll spend all you make. If you are around people who go to more ball games than concerts, chances are excellent that you'll do the same. If you're around people who don't read many books, chances are excellent you won't read many books. People around us can keep nudging us off course a little at a time until finally, 10 years from now, we find ourselves asking, how did I get here? Those subtle influences need to be studied carefully if we really want our lives to turn out the way we plan. Of course, you must be the judge. You must determine whether the situation and the people call for disassociation or limited association. But remember, if it isn't taking you where you want to be five years from now, 10 years from now, now is the time to fix it. Spending more time with the right people, people of substance and culture, people who understand philosophy and discipline, people of accomplishment and character. Many years ago, Mr. Schultz said to me, Mr. Rohn, if you truly wish to be successful, you've got to get around the right people. Keep asking the question, who can I get around? Who could I spend some time with? who would have a positive influence on my life. Don't pick up your plan, especially your financial plan, from unsuccessful people. This is called association on purpose. Getting around the right people by expanding your circle of influence. Listen to me, man. You have a great life in front of you. But your great life is in front of you. It's not behind you. What you did back there ain't got nothing to do with what God got for you. What you did back there was learn the lessons to get you to where you are at this particular moment right here. But what God got for you, do you know, man, that you can actually mess your life completely up? You can jack it all the way up 
and you can turn around and get it right. Do you understand that? Do you understand that you could have had a baby out of wedlock and still be all right? Do you know that you can be divorced multiple times and still be okay? Do you understand that you cannot have a degree and still be just fine? You want to know how I know? Because I'm telling you what I know. I lost everything twice. I don't know if you've ever lost everything before, but I've been bottomed out twice. I done seen rock bottom two times. I've been through some walls up in here, man. I'm just trying to tell you, man, God is really with you. You ain't got to believe me. You ain't got to believe me. But keep doing it without God. Let me know how it worked for you. Matter of fact, write a book on how to make it without God. Because I want to I wanna read it. I want to read the first page. And then I want to read the last page because there ain't going to be but two. You can jack your life all the way up. God is in the forgiving business. You can make all the mistakes you want to make or think you shouldn't make. God is in the get it together business. If you got dreams and visions, I got news for you. God is in the make your dream come true business. He did it for me, how he won't do it for you. A lot of y'all better than me. I'm just gonna flat out tell you. you ain't, most of y'all ain't done what I had to do to get to where I am today. You just ain't had to do this type of dirt. You ain't been homeless, so what, what you, you ain't, you ain't got to scrap like me. Most of y'all didn't come, you're not old as me. I've overcome it all because I have a relationship with him. And you can listen to me and tell that I'm not a perfect person. I am not a perfect Christian. I have my flaws. I am a flawed human being. But guess what? You are too. You ain't got it all together. I dare you to say you do. I make a lot of money, man. But guess what? I ain't got it all together. I'm hurting. I'm hurting, man. Everybody tripping through something. Everybody, I don't care who you are. You're going through something. But if you got God, you can make it. I'm just telling you this little piece of information. I don't see most of y'all most of the time. So you're sitting here, you're kind of looking at me a little bit. Ah, oh, why Steve talking like this stuff? I'm just trying to put you put you on game. Because let me tell you, all y'all want to be successful. And you want to be happy, but you got to get there. It's a shortcut to getting there. The shortcut to getting there is the relationship with God. If you try it without it, you're going to fail miserably. You're going to sink, man. It's going to be ugly for you. Now, this is what you got to do. Identify your gift and get busy with it. God gave all of you a gift. Identify your gift. It is the thing that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. That's your gift. Get busy at that. If it's drawing, if it's teaching, if it's sharing, if it's caregiving, he put that gift inside of you. He didn't hide it under a rock or put it under the mountain or put it on the mountain somewhere. He put the gift in you. And you look at me any kind of way you want to, what I'm just telling you is real. That's how you become successful. Identify your God-given gift, what he gave you at birth. If you do that, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. I am telling you, that is a fact. God has a plan. You will grow through what you go through. Everything that you're going through, at some point, it makes no sense to you right now. But at some point, God is going to reveal to you why all of these issues, challenges, and problems continue to show up and what you were supposed to learn from it. I want you to live the life you were meant to live. Some of you are not transitioning because you're okay with the life you have. And I'm telling you, I, I, when I walk out, I want to be an example of you can start from wherever and get to wherever you want to get to. That's what I'm asking you to do. What fuels you? The reason why you're so lazy is not because you don't have the ability. You're so lazy because your dream's so small. Everybody sees people who look great who have all the confidence, who have all the self-esteem, 
who have all this ability, who have all these things going for them, and they think they got it all figured out. They think it's easy for them. And that's one of the justifications that they tell themselves, all right? It's not like there aren't days I don't want to go to the gym. The, the truth is, most of the days I don't want to go to the gym, but I do, even though I don't feel it. Like it doesn't matter if there's a fucking tornado, if there's a snowstorm, if there's a hurricane, if the fucking world is on fire, the job has to get done. It's about executing regardless of your emotions. You're waiting for all the situations to come together perfectly. And I'm telling you, you cannot wait. You got to start working right now. To take that first step towards greatness is very hard. That's the hardest step to do, that first step, right? That first step towards greatness is hard. What's a lot harder is what time expires in life. You look back on your life knowing you could have been great. That's something you can't control anymore. It's not going out. But if you don't believe you can do it, don't even start the journey. It's too hard. It's a winnable, easy war. But if you don't, if you don't believe it, then don't do it. Every single day of my life, I feel like giving a hundred. Every single day, somebody said yesterday, each eat. You gave 120. What you gonna do tomorrow? I said I don't know. Give 140. I don't know, but I don't have days where I don't feel like it. Why? Because I'm counting on me. My wife's counting on me. My son's counting on me. I don't have days to wait. Will there be some times that you want to give up? Yes. When you get into a tight spot and everything goes against you until it seems that you cannot hold on for a minute longer, never give up then, because that is just the place and time that the tide will turn. Never give up then, and that is so important. When you're working on doing the things you want to do and filling your dream, and things happen, there are times when your energy feels so depleted but you want to give up that it looks just totally impossible. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, don't give up then. That's when you've got to fall forward, when life is kicking dirt in your face. Don't give up then. That's when most people turn back. If you've decided that this is what you want to do, you've got to become courageous to stand up within yourself, to face it and step forward. The biggest thing that always troubled me was my imagination. Because it was so big when I was a kid. You know, I grew up poor, but I was always imagining stuff. You know, my mama, once a month, would buy a travel magazine at the grocery store. My father used to be so pissed off. Bill, why are we spending this money? We ain't got, we were poor. She said, Slick, we ain't got no money to take this boy nowhere. But if he can look in these magazines, maybe one day, It'll, it'll, it'll cause him to want to travel. I've been to so many countries around the world because of that magazine. I just wanted to go see stuff. My mama had enough sense to plant that seed. It's like at Christmas time, we used to get in the car. My daddy used to take us to the suburbs so we could see the lights. And, you know, we just drove around the lights. I, could, I was amazed at the suburbs because I would see these big houses with horseshoe driveways where you drove in and came out the other side. So I told my daddy one time, he was riding, I said, Daddy, why don't we get one of them houses? He said, boy, I ain't got no money for that, but that's what I'm bringing you out here for. She said, one day you'll be able to get one of them houses. Let me explain something to you. Because of that right there, I've probably had in my lifetime now about 11 homes. I got four now in different states. Every house I own, got a horseshoe drive. Somebody was talking on the phone with that cord on the wall and got sick of it and said, you know what, man, if I could just go outside and talk on the phone, ta-da, we got cell phones. Somebody got tired of driving across the country and said, man, if I could fly over there, boom, we got airplanes. Imagination is everything. It's a preview to life's coming attraction. Everything you've ever imagined is real. It is impossible for you to think an impossible thought. That is impossible. You can't think something that ain't possible. You ain't that smart. So if it's in your head, you got to ask yourself, how did it get there? That's God showing you a preview of a coming attraction he has for you. The problem with most people is you think your imagination is hocus pocus. It's really not. 
It's a preview of a coming attraction. If you react to your imagination, that's where your real life is. It's just God showing you what he has for you. And so they go through life holding back. Holding back on life, not understanding this also, that what you hold back from life, life holds back from you. So most of us go through life, ladies and gentlemen, not giving, and we're cheating ourselves, and you're also cheating life. One of the things you see with people all the time is that maybe they're trying to stumble forward towards their ideal, as poorly defined as it might be. But then they're afraid, right? They're afraid about what they might encounter. And that stops them because fear does stop people. It freezes you like a prey on them. And so people move ahead, but then they get afraid and then they stop moving ahead. And that's not so good because negative emotion is a really powerful motivator. So we're more motivated by negative emotion than positive emotion. All right, now here's my last point about failure. Sometimes it's the best way to figure out where you're going. Your life will never be a straight path. You'll see what I mean about taking risks or being willing to fail. Because taking risk is not just about going for a job. It's also about knowing what you know and what you don't know. It's about being open to people and to ideas. Somewhere along the way, they've lost the ability to focus on the things they are great at, stacking those promises they make themselves. And the way I get them to break their soul, it's not correcting their swing or getting them positive. It's getting them to acknowledge the small problems and showing up the batting practice or getting that extra bucket of balls. Beginning to reward themselves for the extra promises they keep to themselves puts them back in a state of self confidence all of a sudden they're getting the ball free. The word we use for this, for short, is we call it sensory acuity. Sensory acuity is the idea that you want to become acutely sensitive to whether what you're doing is working or not. You don't want to just say, okay, I know what I want, I know what I want, and I'm going to make it happen, this is how I'm going to do it. You keep hammering it, hammering it, hammering it, doing something that doesn't work. People do this all the time, right? Do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. It's called insanity. You can't do the same thing again and again, expect a different result, see if it doesn't get result. Does this mean it's always going to be like that? Not at all. Why? The longer you're in business, you eventually find a group of people that buy into you. You eventually find a group of people that understand how consistent you are. You eventually find a group of people that want to be in business with you forever. You eventually find a group of people that like your style. You eventually find a group of people that like your vision, your crusade, your cause, your mission, and your vision is so big that other people's vision also fits into it. But it won't happen right off the bat. What happens if they change their minds? Do you also change your mind? What happens if they say no? Do you also get down on yourself and say, oh my gosh, I don't have the business for me? No. Don't let other people's emotions and decisions and constant changing their minds dictate your mind. I mean, you know in your bones that you're gonna make it out. And I think that's something that was a little different about me. It was like in that hole as advisors were saying, look, just go BK and seven years from now you can walk away from it. I just knew I would fight my way out of it. And I didn't have to convince myself or anybody else. There's always more room to grow there's always more knowledge to gain, always more skills to perfect. We're never done with the education process because education is part of the path to wealth. Education and learning is part of the path to health. Continued education can turn you around if you're headed in the wrong direction. We need the mental food that others provide. We need mental exercise. We need to open up our minds to different alternatives. We need to learn to appreciate the other side of the debate so that we can strengthen our own and defend our own. We need to expose ourselves to a wide range of thoughts and philosophies and ideologies. You've got to listen to a variety of speakers, read a variety of books. No one speaker has all the answers for you. No one book has all the answers. You can't get all the answers from one person. We need a variety of influence to give us input, to give us ideas, to manage our business, to manage our relationships, to manage our finances, to take advantage of our time. We need a variety of influences. We need a variety of books in our library. We need a variety of tapes in our video library, our audio library. We need a variety of voices. And here's what else we need. 
We need a variety of points of view. Points of view can be so valuable. Somebody says, did you ever see it from over here? And you say, no. So you step over there where they are and you take a look back over here from their point of view. And you say, my gosh, I never thought from this perspective. It's so different. No wonder you think the way you do. Here's the clue. Take advantage of all that's available in terms of mental food and mental exercise. Be eager to learn. Always be eager to learn, no matter how far along you are in the journey, no matter where you are in your success. Keep that eagerness to learn. Gather up as much knowledge as you can. And then what? Debate it. Put it all on the table and look at it. Dissect it. Turn it around and stare at it. Ask questions, make statements. Don't take it for granted that one person has all the answers you're looking for. Take their knowledge, but don't take it as the only knowledge. Make sure that what you finally do, the model you develop of strong appreciation for your own style and your own methods and your own process for achievement, make sure that what you finally do is a product of your own conclusion. That's what's valuable. Not to just go do what someone says without debating it. Consider the source and then do it your way. You can take an interest in what someone says, digest it, take notes on it, but then debate it, look at it from all angles. Be a student, not a follower. Building your ambition is a process unique to each and every one of us. Gather all the knowledge that you can. Then develop your approach as a product of your own conclusions. Your own conclusions, not someone else's conclusions. Your own conclusions. You can't fall for other people's philosophies. They may not be right. As you collect knowledge, you must sort through it and find out what's valuable. Then you can develop your own philosophy. And your own philosophy becomes the most important of your guidance system one of your guiding lights. So develop your own plan, lest you get into trouble with someone else's. And debate the plans of others, the philosophies of others, the achievement styles of others, the way others appreciate themselves. Debate all this. Why? Because it affects everything. The value you place on your plan, the value you place on yourself, the value you place on life in general, affects everything around you. It even affects how you respect time, the 24 hours a day given to each of us to do with as we please. There's a connection between appreciating yourself and appreciating and respecting time. People who appreciate themselves understand and respect the use of time. Here's what I call the best kept secret of the rich. Interesting discovery that I made one day I couldn't believe it when I found out that rich people have about 24 hours a day and poor people have about 24 hours a day. Wouldn't that drive you mad until you found out what the difference was? I'm telling you the difference is in the management of the time. A few simple disciplines practiced every day and your whole life can change. Your future can change, your income can change. When they was living, they told me one time, they was sitting up watching TV. My daddy looked at my mama and said, Bill, he called my mama Bill and said, can you believe that this little boy we had on TV? She said, Slick, I can't believe this. I used to send my daddy $5,000 a week. You know, when I first got on TV, I was making $55,000 a week, so I sent my mama in $5,000 a week. When I got into Kings of Comedy, my father was still living. I showed my daddy one time how much money I made. He said, boy, it take me four years to make this time. So I was able to give them something with my life. I always wanted God to just lift me up so before my mom and them left this world, I could give them something. I bought them everything, man, houses, cars, furniture. I bought them everything I could try. I'm 62 years old. I still want them to be proud of me. I'm still hoping. Stay in heaven watching. 
and they see me turn into something. That's all I ever wanted. It was in my imagination to take care of you. Everything that's in your imagination, God gonna make it come true for you. You just got to believe that. God make dreams come true. He take poor kids with speech impediments and put them all over TV. If God can do that for me, explain to me how he can't do it for you. You just got to believe, man. Don't ever give up and keep believing because God is real. Don't you listen to nobody telling you God ain't real. You can learn from negative as well as positive. The Bible is such a great book because it is a collection of human stories on both sides of the ledger. One list of human stories is called examples, do what these people did. And the other list of human stories is called warnings, don't do what these clods did. What a wealth of information, what to do and what not to do. I think it also means, however, that if your story ever gets in somebody's book, make sure they use it as an example, not a warning. All the successful people I know and work with around the world are good readers. They just read, read, read. They are so curious that they are driven to read because they just have to know. It is one of the things they all have in common. Here's a good phrase. All leaders are readers. And they use cassette programs too, especially while they're in the car or during other times when they can't read. Cassettes can help all of us easily pick up new ideas and new skills. Did you know there are cassettes and books on how to be stronger, more decisive, a better speaker, a more effective leader, have a better effect on other people, become more loving, develop personality, get rich, develop influence, become sophisticated, and people don't use them? How would you explain that? Did you know that hundreds of successful people have written their stories in books and told how they did it on cassettes like this and people don't want to listen? How would you explain that? The guy's busy, I guess. He says, well, yeah, if you worked where I work, by the time you struggle home, it's late. You've got to have a bite to eat, watch a little TV and get to bed. You can't stay up half the night and read, read, read. And this is the guy that's behind on his bill. He's a good worker, hard worker, sincere, but remember, you can be sincere and work hard all your life and wind up broke, confused and embarrassed. You've got to be better than a good worker. You've got to be a good reader, a good listener. At least you could hear a good cassette on the way home, right? Now, you don't have to read or listen to educational cassettes half the night. Although if you're broke, it's a good place to start. But here is all I ask, just 30 minutes a day. That's all. Stretch it to an hour if you can, but at least 30 minutes. Hear or read something challenging, something instructional, at least 30 minutes a day. And here's the next key, every day, don't miss. Miss a meal, but not your 30 minutes. Hey, you can get along without some meals, but you can't get along without some ideas, examples, and inspiration. There's a Bible phrase that says, humans cannot live on bread alone, or food alone. It says the next most important thing to bread is words. Words nourish the mind, words nourish the soul. Humans have to have food and words to be healthy and prosperous. Make sure you have a good diet of words every day. I told my staff one day, some people read so little they have rickets of the mind. And also remember to properly feed the mind, you must have good balance. Don't just read or listen to the easy stuff. You can't live on mental candy. Here is a thought. Why not call good books and cassettes tapping the treasure of ideas? That's it. Tapping the treasure of ideas, like you're doing with this program. And if somebody's got a good excuse for not tapping the treasure of ideas for at least 30 minutes every day, or spending the money and getting the books and cassettes, I'd like to hear it. Invest the money, get the cassettes and books. The best money you can spend is money invested in your self-education. Don't shortchange yourself when it comes to investing in your own better future. Let me tell you the problem with your imagination. The problem with your imagination is you tell it to the wrong people. 
If you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. Do you know how many times God has showed you something in your imagination that you knew was just for you? You were so excited when he came to you, you went and you shared it with your family and friends. You know what they did? They shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. You know why they couldn't see it? Because God didn't show it to them. He showed it to you. He showed you the evidence of things not seen. See, they might love you, but they don't know what God gonna do for you. My teacher thought she was sparing me. Take your stupid self up there and try to audition for TV with this stuttering problem. She thought she was saving me. She might have even meant well. But she didn't know. Her. See, your mama and them, your cousin and them, your friends, they don't know. See, you got to be careful when you share your imagination with small-minded people. Nobody else can see your imagination but you. But see, it ain't just you imagining stuff. It's your God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. If I'm manipulating you, I'm trying to get you to do something. If I'm leading you, I'm trying to get you to do something. And many of the tools are very similar. So what's the difference between me leading you and me manipulating you? It's very easy for me to answer that question. If I'm manipulating you, I'm trying to get you to do something that's going to benefit me. If I'm leading, I'm trying to get you to do something that's going to benefit you, that's going to benefit the team, that's going to benefit the mission. So for me, those are those are too easy. Those are too easy. It's, it's real obvious. And, and by the way, if I'm a manipulator, I can get away with that for a little while, but eventually you're going to look at me for what I am. You're going to see that the maneuvers I'm making, the tools I'm using, I'm utilizing those tools for my own benefit. And as soon as you see that, you you won't fully support it. You, you won't. The same goes for when I'm trying to make you do something good for yourself and for the team. You're going to see that too. And you're going to say, he's, he actually cares about you. That's what he's doing. This for. And when you know I care about you, you'll do anything for me. I mean, that's what it boils down to. Oh, I want to give you hard criticism. How do I give you hard criticism? The first thing I have to do is make sure that you understand I care about you. Which is not, which is not easy to do. And it's not always obvious. But if you know that more than anything else, what I want is for you to be successful, when I say, hey Tom, I'm looking at the outcome of the last project, and you were three weeks past the time. I think there's some things that we can do to kind of make you a little bit more efficient in leading these things. If you know that my number one thing is that I care about you, you can be all ears. To an extent. Because guess what percentage of the world is truly open for criticism? Oh, it's tiny. <laughs> There's so few people that are truly open to criticism.